kind of the, the inspiration for I'm going to take the talk today is this book by David Meister. It's called Strategy in the Fat Smoker. Now, David Meister, he's awesome. He's essentially a consultant for consultants. And if you do any kind of knowledge work in the world, you're a consultant, right? It doesn't matter if you work inside a large organization, a small organization, or you actually work in a consultancy. You, your entire job is consulting. Um, so a couple books he has. One is, one is The Trusted Advisor, which is awesome. It's really thin, really short. It's like a list of things to do to become a trusted advisor, which is a good consultant. And he also has this great book called um, Managing the Professional Services Firm, which is essentially managing a consulting practice. Since you're all knowledge workers, that's what you do. They're both good books. You should read them. But um, one of his last books was Strategy and the Fat Smoker. And uh, you can actually find a couple uh, videos online of him uh, presenting uh, about his book. But the, the general gist of the, the book is this, right? Um, if you're a fat smoker, you know that smoking's bad for you, and you know that being overweight's bad for you, right? There's no, you don't need a consultant to come in and tell you, stop smoking, lose weight, right? You know this. Um, and that's what Meister's book is all about, right? You don't need anyone else coming up with 10 points to success, 10 points to selling things, 10 points to pitching. And likewise, we all know that user experience is powerful. We all know it makes lots of money, right? A Apple had more cash in the bank a few weeks ago than the Treasury did. Uh, a few months ago, they're, they're more viable than ExxonMobil. Um, I did a project recently with, uh, for Verizon Fios where we increased conversions by 40%, right, 40%, not because of better visual design, right, but because of better user experience, right? So the, the original version of this presentation had several slides with case studies, right, all, these, all this money that you can make with better user experience, but everybody knows that, right? Does anybody here need further proof that user experience makes money or saves money? Nobody? Okay, good. So um, we're going to change this a bit. And this is, this is going to be GT getting things done for, uh, for design, right? Because everybody, everybody where you work knows the power of user experience, right? So it's not a matter of selling them on that. It's actually getting people to actually commit and create better experiences. Whether you're designing services or products, it doesn't really matter. So we're going to have a couple things here. This is the back channel stuff. Uh, if, you, if you want to tweet anything, feel free. Um, please use the hashtag GT designed. That, that was, um, it's not the best hashtag, but work with me here. Um, and I'm at Austin Cavell on Twitter. Uh, for the front channel, uh, I already have the slides up on SlideShare. You can go there. Um, it's slideshare.net slash Austin Cavella, and then it's the last one I uploaded. So if you'd like to pull them down and follow along as you go through. Uh, a lot of the links and books are already hyperlinked, so you can just click through in the presentation. Um, and definitely after this, I, I spend a lot of, all of my time kind of sitting at home thinking about this, and that's not very exciting. Uh, so in between episodes of Law and Order, I think about how to help organizations become better user experience cultures. Uh, if you ever have any questions, any ideas, any pitches, complaints, uh, anything, uh, I would love to hear from you. Catch me on Twitter or email, or you can also catch my blog, which is thinkingmaking.com. Uh, this is my manifesto, though, and this is something that's kind of emerged over the last, uh, last several years. I've been doing a lot of work with Agile teams, and, um, and it doesn't matter, matter whether I'm working with an organization that's massive, something like Comcast Interactive that has tons and tons of digital properties and they have a huge design arm and huge, huge, uh, you know, just bookshelves and bookshelves full of engineers cranking away on code. Um, or if you're at some small shop where it's you and one developer and a client who, who calls you every five minutes, right? It doesn't matter the size of your organization, designers are the people responsible for the user experience, right? It's your whole organization, right? So if you have the most awesome user experience design in the world, and they create the most awesome interface, um, or the most awesome advertisement, or the most awesome uh, service that you can think of. But the CEO comes in and says, I want blue and some more clowns, right? You're going to have blue and more clowns because that's the CEO, right? That's, you're not going to really have much against that. So it, it doesn't matter how strong either you are or someone on your team is with your experience, your entire organization has to kind of live that, live that, live that think, thought process. The, the second thing I've noticed is that there are seven barriers. Now, those are seven barriers I identified. I don't think that list is exclusive or inclusive. It's just I came up with seven. Um, it, it, it seems like it's a nice number two when you draw it out. It looks nice on a PowerPoint slide. Um, but those are value, focus, time, memory, quality, understanding, and improvement. So in your organization, you'll probably recognize that you have one or more of these seven barriers, right? And so as we go through the talk, I'm going to bring mentioned seven tactics, right, that you can specifically use tomorrow, if you have to go into work tomorrow, like I do, or on Monday, um, that you can actually just start using on Monday to help improve the user experience culture where you work. Um, and I think the most important thing is instead of changing what you do, you have to change how you do it. So 
Uh, it's not the fact, none of the tactics you can see are actually different activities that you might be different from a normal work day. It's actually how you do them that changes, right? It's about being more um, inclusive and collaborative and um, helping everybody else at your organization become uh, more familiar and actually just crave better user experiences. Um, so this book is really good. Paul already has a couple books out there. Um, but the, t the title says it's R, right? It's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. And one of the really great, um, it's, it's full, of, full of these aphorisms about um, just how, how to be better in advertising. But if you take out the word advertising and substitute your job title, right, it would totally apply to you. It's, again, we're all knowledge workers and consultants. It's the same game, um, doesn't matter where you are. But this, he has this one great phrase there is, don't look for the next opportunity. The one you have in hand now is the opportunity, right? And this is, and I think what this means to me is that you're always thinking, well, the next, this, one, this project sucks. The deadline is crappy. We've got, we've got terrible clients. We don't have the, the resources we need to do a better job. So on my next project, right, my next project, I swear it's going to be different and better. But, but you can't ke always keep looking for the next project, right? The project you're working on right now, right, the one that's sitting at your desk that you're thinking about in between sessions that you need to go check your email, you have to go, go home this weekend and crank something out, that's a project, right, that you need to be improving the experience on. So this is some more thinking just before I launch into all the tactics. Um, there's a great book by Sidney Bowles and James Box, Undercover User Experience Design. It's essentially how do you kind of uh, improve the levels of user experience um, on projects, kind of with no money, no time, kind of, you know, undercover. And there's a, a book coming out from Leah Bully called The UX Team of One that'll be out next year. And actually, um, Jeff Godhealth just announced a book that he's doing for O'Reilly called Lean UX. Um, and that'll be coming out next year as well. So there's, there's tons of resources out there if you want a way to do it faster, cheaper, better, um, which is, I think, is, uh, those are often the reasons that people give as to why you can't have a better experience, right? Because it's not fast enough, it's not cheap enough, right? We're busy. So just, just some grounding here. This is, this is um, what is UX? And th these aren't, um, these are kind of eight general questions I ask myself whenever I come across any project, right? It doesn't matter if you're designing a, a product, or service, if it's virtual um, or in the real world, it doesn't matter if it's a billboard that you see on the highway or if it's a banner ad that you see on a website, right? These, these eight questions apply, right? Um, and and the, these eight questions get to the entire context, right, that, you're, that your audience is going to experience whatever your project is, right? Whatever that is, um, you have to understand the project in order to make it more effective. So. Um, you would need to understand where your audience is going to use interface, right? For work, from home, the car. Uh, is it going to be while they're in the bathroom? Is it going to be while they're in the backyard? Is it while they're walking around a mall trying to find your store? Where are they going to be using your interface? Um, you want to know how often they're going to be using it, right? Are they going to pull it up really quickly for 30 seconds? Are they going to spend four hours using it? Are they going to use it once a month, twice a month, once a year, once ever? Um, and then you need to know what do they need to know, right, in order to use interface? Is it something they can take some time to learn? Or is it something that they, um, that they don't have time to learn? Right? So, so for example, if, if for online interfaces, it's getting hot. Um, if, it's, if, it, if you're designing like an application for an internet, you can assume, well, these people are hired there, they can go through training, they're going to be there for a couple years. We can make it suck a little because they'll take time to learn it, right? They're going to be in it you know, several hours a day. Okay. But let's say you're doing a sign-up screen for um, a software as a service that you're setting up. Right? And the, the, the onboarding process has to be as frictionless as possible or else your users won't stop and give you their money. Um, one, right, you can require them to learn. The other one, there has to be no learning. It has to be so obvious that they don't even know, they don't even realize that they're going through an interface. You know um, how critical the interaction is, right? If they fail, right, is if you, if you hit the wrong button when you're trying to avert a meltdown, well, you're screwed. Right? If you hit the wrong button when you're trying to like something on Facebook, big deal. Um, you want to know how important it is. Uh, I've missed signing up for my health insurance a couple correctly a couple times in my life because the interfaces for those for those uh, for health insurance applications suck. Um, I even asked. I have a friend who's in HR, and I even called her one time and asked, "Do they do that on purpose because they don't want you to sign up?" And she said, "No, they're really it saves them money if you sign up. I don't know why they suck." Um, and you also want to know how complex interaction is and how focused user will be. There's a great article in Boxes Air, Box and Arrows. I think I have a screenshot here later on. It's about are users smart or dumb, and 
and it's, it sounds kind of mean to say user dumb, but what the author is talking about is that are they even paying attention? Are they being distracted by things? Are they tired? Are they busy? What else is going on? So you want to know how focused they're going to be. Are they going to be totally focused on what you're doing, like Photoshop? You might spend three hours just zoned in, totally focused. Um, but if you're checking your email, you're probably not focused at all, right? You're reading messages, you're opening links, you're responding. Uh, that's not really a, as much of a flow experience. So these are the seven barriers um, to designing better experiences that you, you'll see in organizations. And I've seen these, like I said, I've seen these at large enterprises, and I've seen these at uh, small design shops. Uh, first is that they don't value the design. Uh, they, don't, they can't focus on the design activities they need to focus on. They don't have time to design everything they need to design. They don't remember design decisions, so maybe on Monday you decide, yeah, we'll have the button here because we think that'll be better, but on Friday someone else asks where's the button going to be and they make, change their mind for, you know, no good reason. Um, there's a low quality of design that's done by the person who's not the designer. Um, the organization doesn't understand what it takes to do good quality user experience. And most importantly, I think, is that you can't validate the improvement in user experience, right? Um, and really, as I was putting this together, I, I kind of dawned on me that it's not really about user experience, right? It's about being effectiveness. So I, I, this is the same, this is the previous slide. I just changed design and UX to the word effectiveness. And I think this might actually be, be a better way to talk about it in your organization, right? Is um, how do we make this more effective, right? Are you for or against being more effective? It's kind of like saying kittens. No one's really against kittens um, unless they've you know, pooped on something important that you have. <laughs> and um, I actually have... A, a series of posts at the Follow the UX Leader blog that, explo that ex explores each of these barriers more in depth. We're going to kind of gloss over them here, but if you want more information, um, this link is in the presentation, and you can um, just click on it if you go to SlideShow. And, oh, one more. This is like a sales pitch. I swear to God it's not a sales pitch. My heart's in the right place here. If, if any of this is of interest to you and you're in town, on Tuesday we're having a workshop on how to do design critiques. And it's not just, you know, a bunch of designers in internal necks sitting around talking about how we're going to critique our artwork. No. This is about how to frame a project um, with very clear goals and context. So everybody in the organization, the business, the engineers, the designers, uh, everybody has the same understanding of it. And then how to review an interface or an ad or, or service to see if it meets the goals you're going after, right? So this is a way to push user experience thinking into your organization. And if you are an entrepreneur or a startup or an app developer, you're invited to come and bring interfaces, screens, sketches, mock-ups, working code, to have actual UX designers go and critique. Um, so this will give you an opportunity to practice or learn more if you're interested in this kind of stuff. It's at Caroline Collective on Tuesday. I think we're going to have like a crap ton of free tacos if you like tacos. That's the place to be. So here's the first barrier, right? The organization doesn't value design. When I joined Comcast Interactive uh, six years ago or something like that, um, this wonderful user experience uh, manager named Livia Labate had joined there, and she's building UX practice. And one of the problems she found is that even though she was she was you know had good people working for her, is that the business wasn't reaching out reaching out to her to to leverage her team's skill set on the projects they had. And as you can take by the name, Comcast Interactive did nothing but interactive projects. And they had millions of users, and they make lots of money or don't make lots of money. So the user experience is very, very critical to these types of things. So the problem is that, the, is that it's not that they didn't understand, right, the user experience design was very important to the project. They did. But the problem is when a manager is busy, right, and they've got, this, they've got this firm deadline, they've got these firm stretch goals that their manager has given them, and they're trying to put all the pieces of their project together, um, if you don't know how a piece fits really well, you're not going to plug it in, right? If you've got this, all these firm constraints and you're kind of stressed in any way, you know that programs can take this much time, you'll get this quality, design will take this much time, you'll get this quality, well, what the hell are you supposed to do with user experience? It's fuzzy. So one of the great things that Livy did is she told a story, and there are three things that good stories have. First is they're true, right? You can't, if you tell a story that's not true, it's obvious at first glance, um, and people don't trust it, right? The second thing is that good stories use memorable words and images, and they also remember something important, right? Telling you a true story about, about how um, I saw a blade of grass today is, you know, totally not important at all. It's a waste of your time. But if I tell you a true story about how about how I saw a young child stop another, uh, save another child from bullying, then that's something important you might remember and share on, pass along. So this is the story that Livia told, right? Um, 
This is what we do. This is part of an internal presentation that she went and gave to all the other managers around her to explain what they did. And you can see she has three memorable words there, right? Discover, model, validate. She uses a memorable image. It's a Venn diagram. Um, and then as you can see, under each of the sections, right, discover, model, and validate, she actually lists the specific activities that her team can do, right? Specific concrete activities, not, um, you know, we can make your experience better, but we can do task analysis, we can do uh, usability testing, we do prototype validation, we can do business goals assessment. That's kind of fuzzy though, right? But, um, but this essentially gave them a menu, so they could walk in on the next project and say, well, I think this project would benefit from a task analysis, usability testing, and a prototype, right? Pick the things off the menu, call Livia up, she assigns someone from her team, and the project benefits, right? Um, their, the manager's project does better, Comcast makes more money, um, everybody's happy. It's more effective. This is uh, another story. Um, this was done by Peter Morville. He's, uh, he's a famous information architect, he's called UX Honeycomb. Um, are any of you all familiar with this already? Have you seen it floating around? It used to be everywhere. Um, but the great thing about this isn't, isn't that it kind of like sums up all the kind of fuzzy terms that user experience encompasses. The great thing that I love is the story that Peter told about how he used it with his clients, which he would present this like a menu and say, well, I can help you on this project make it more accessible and desirable. Um, what point here on the point here in the honeycomb as to what aspects you want to improve, and that helped him kind of frame the conversation with his clients. Uh, this is the story about the stupid users and smart design, right? And um, this was designed as being something you could print out and stick in your cube. That the author wanted to go along with the story, and uh, as you can see, he talks about you know is, is your users stressed, tired, untrained, passive, independent, distracted? Then you were designed for simplicity, memory, autopilot, recovery, and testing, right? He uses um, a couple of acronyms, there's a, there's a, there's a funny image. Um, this, is, this is a good story. So, when you go back to work, we'll say you go back to work on Monday, um, cough drop, you want to think of a story that you want to tell, tell the people around you, right? And remember, your whole goal isn't to uh, create a great interface, right? Your whole goal is to make everybody in your company want to create better interfaces, right? You can't do it alone. So you want to think about, think of a story that's true. Um, you want to make it memorable and make it important. And you want to start just, and you don't even have to start with a diagram, just start doing an elevator pitch, right? Bump into somebody and drop a little mind seed in their brain that maybe six weeks from now will blossom and they'll be the one who's, who's pushing for better user experience. This is the second barrier, right? Organization can't focus on, on the important design activities. Uh, this happens at a lot of places, right? You know, you really know that your project would be better if you had some usability testing, but um, you can't even think about usability testing because you're worried about all this other crap. So this is another story from Comcast. It's about unsexy UX. Um, so essentially what's happened is they're rolling out a new product, right? This is what eventually became Xfinity. And if you, if you can imagine, the company is, has, has made a huge bet on Xfinity, right? It's kind of like watch TV anywhere, right? If you're a Comcast subscriber. Um, they think it's the future of TV. I mean, everybody thinks that now, right? But, you know, six years ago, it was, it was more uncertain. And every, every two weeks, the CEO walked in with, like, a new, new uh, greatest and best thing that we have to implement right now, right? So the engineers are constantly cranking out new features. Um, if we wanted to change a piece of copy on a registration form to make it perform better, or if we wanted to make a, a, a change the order of some links so they were more usable, that there was no way that that was going to make it to the top of the sprint backlog, right? That was important, but always got bumped by other other things. So we implemented a UX bucket, and what this is is that um, is that you you uh, you take a set of time, right? You know your developers have X amount of time, or your design resources, your copywriters have X amount of time. And you, uh, you resource them for a certain amount of time on a project. But you just take a chunk of that time and say, that is dedicated, right? That is de de dedicated to improving the fuck out of everything, right? Um, so the important things with the UX bucket, right? That's inviolable. You can only use it for UX activities, right? This isn't, this isn't to add a new feature unless you want to add a new feature. This isn't, you know, to, to, to make sure you hit the deadline on time. This is, this is only for the things that you want to do to use improve the user experience, right? And it's responsive. If, if you work in, with uh, agile teams or if you have a long uh, uh, planning, planning phase up front, you don't have to schedule the bucket in either the planning meeting or in your long planning phase up front. You can walk in the, that day, that morning, and go up to your, your developer or your resource and say, okay, today we're going to do this. Or if you want, you can say, okay, for the next two weeks we're going to work on this. 
however you want. The point is, it's responsive to the user experience, right, because user experience is important, and not responsive to the rest of the project thing. Um, and no one is responsible, right? So say the developer works on something for two weeks and it doesn't work out, right? Say you're just exploring something, that's fine. You don't have to ship. You, the whole point here is to improve the user experience. Either you're building things, measuring things, or learning about things, right? It doesn't, um, you don't actually have to ship anything at the end. Now, it sounds scary, right? Like no project manager is going to do this. The UX bucket was actually, um, the idea actually came from the product manager at Comcast who was running the Xfinity project. He, he wanted a way to get all the UX fixes into the project without having to fight developers over, over um, database modeling, right? Um, I've seen this work at uh, Comcast. I've seen it work at a large software company in Austin called Convio. Um, it's worked everywhere I've seen it applied, and there isn't a lot of resistance because you sit down at the table with anybody, they'll say, yes, user experience is important. Yes, user experience usually gets bumped down behind you know, the newest, sexiest feature. Um, the, the selling this is, is really, really pretty easy. Um, and if you have, want to try this selling this at where you work and you're having trouble or you're worried about how you're framing it, feel free to, to shoot me an email. Um, I've done it three times now and it's, it's, um, it, really, it really works really well. Um, this is the third barrier, right? So organization says it didn't have time to do all the design it needs to do. Um, so this is, this, is, this is my favorite, but it's also kind of like the, the weirdest one, right? This, my advice here, if you don't have design, time to design everything the way you need to do, is to slough work. But just, just don't do it then, right? And um, it sounds kind of like, it sounds kind of, you know, you're just kind of whatever. But if you're a professional, right? If you're a professional, then you commit to deliver a certain item at a certain quality within a certain amount of time. And if, if where you're working, right, if they're requiring you to, to commit to more items at more quality in less time than you can deliver, and you commit to that, well, that's, you're screwing up, right? That's not professional. Um, a professional does what they can do, how they can do it, when they can do it. That's, that's, what, that's what a professional does. Um, so if you're in an or environment where you don't have that option, then let it lie. You pick the one project, the one that's most critical, the one that needs to be most awesome, right? The one that's going to be the hardest to do, right? It really needs the most UX love, and the one that fits in your schedule, and devote all your time to that. The ones that don't fit, well, they don't get the UX love. And the great thing about this is your project comes out and it looks awesome. It's great, it's fantastic, everybody loves, loves it. I've never seen a project with good UX actually not meet the goals it set out to meet, right? So if you're looking for specific conversion goals or satisfaction goals, or usability goals, right? If you're aiming for those goals, UX as a process just is designed to meet that kind of stuff. Um, so you'll be demonstrating the value of good user experience. Um, you'll be illustrating the impact of the time trade-off, right? So you're essentially saying, instead of spreading myself one-third on three projects, I'm going to devote myself entirely, 100% on one project. And the business can see from the value that you create on the one project exactly what the trade-off is, right? They know, they know what it looks like when you split yourself between all the projects, because they've been seeing that for years. But when you devote yourself to one project, they can actually see the qualitative difference in the result. And that's awesome. And, and I know this is, I'm saying this last, but I think the most important thing is that you level up your team, right? The more practice you do, the more review you have, the better designs you do, um, all that stuff is copied by everybody else's organization. So this time, you, you focus on one project and you knock it out of the park. Next time, you focus on one project and knock it out of the park. And the developers who are working on the other projects, next time, they copy things that they saw you do well in the first project, which means their projects end up better. And that's what it's all about, right? Is that everything coming out of your organization has a better user experience. I think leveling up your team is, is the most important thing. So we're going to take a break. Here's an activity. Um, you don't really have to close your eyes that you can. But uh, I want you to think about the project you're working on right now that you know needs better user experience, right? So we've already gone through three barriers and three activities that you can use. Um, as we go through the next um, set of barriers, right, and tactics that you can use to overcome those barriers, um, I want you to think specifically about what on your current project is stopping you from making it rock. Right? It's not for making it better. We want to, the question is, what's stopping you from making it rock? Okay. Barrier four. You don't remember what the hell's going on. Um, so I was at Convio. Convio is this uh, large kind of enterprise nonprofit um, software as a service firm. They, they manage to, they, you know, take donations for the Red Cross. They manage websites for like uh, Komen, the American Cancer Society. Um, really, really big nonprofits, right? People, you know, hundreds of thousands of people working for them. Um, really large systems. And we're working on this preferences screen that was super important, right? People would use it once, um, 
the preferences they set um, were critical, right? Like if, if um, uh, it had to do with, one of them was had to do with spam, right? So if you don't uncheck the box accurately and remember the preference, you don't do it right, well, you can be either reported to um, a spam service and all your stuff is blocked, which is bad, or it's actually, there are legal consequences there. So it's super important, interface be super easy. So we spent five weeks with stakeholders, inter interviewed everybody, we had sketches, we, went, we did mock-ups, we did prototypes, everything was clear, it had to be obvious at first glance, there was no learning involved, right? Um, it had to be super clear because they had to make sure they were checking the right boxes in the right way. Um, and we go into the last meeting, right? We spend the entire meeting on the admin interface, didn't get to the user side screens. I had to jet for another meeting, I leave, that previous meeting runs over. I get an email half an hour later from the project manager, and this beautiful screen that had, you know, like maybe a handful of check boxes, radio buttons, and one save button was turned into a screen that had two huge chunks of items to select from. It had check all, uncheck all functionality, and it had two submit buttons on it, right? Totally the opposite of our design goals, right? That's, that's, that requires that you learn it, and it's not clear in, in the slightest. That happened in like, you know, 15, 20 minutes. That's, that's how long I was out of the room. And the strange thing is that everybody that was in that room had been through the entire process, right? Everybody knew the design goals, everybody knew what we were trying to do, um, but they still screwed it up, right? In 20 minutes, no less, right? Five weeks of work and done in 20 minutes. And the problem is that they didn't remember all the design decisions we made over the previous five weeks and why we'd made them. And that's because we went in to present the screens, we didn't document any of the rationale. Right? I think we probably mentioned the goals of the project, but you know, whatever. Um, but the fact is you can't really remember everything, all the whys for what you do. Um, so then just don't worry about it, just forget it. And you wanna record your rationale alongside your design, right, so you don't have to remember. Right? That's a, if any of you are familiar with the, the getting things done process, right, that's a big part of the process. It's just, if you have a task, don't remember it, stick it in your to-do list. Right? If you've got an appointment or a due date, stick it in the calendar, flush it out of your mind until you need to think about it, and when you do, you can use your system to remind you. Um, everything in work is the same way, right? Use your system to remind you. And with design, um, the rationale includes why you made the decision you made, right? Why is that blue? Why did you use that typeface? Why is the button there, right? Why is there only one button on the screen? Why is it one screen instead of three screens? Um, you want to make sure you're documenting the goal, right? Actually writing it down. Um, you want to make sure you write down who it's for so everybody remembers when they walk in the room who it's for, what the context is, what the constraints are, if there are any technical constraints, um, and if you have any open questions. So this is, this is something that actually came out of that meeting at Convio. Um, I started putting, I use uh, InDesign, 8Shapes has this wonderful uh, InDesign uh, template set called Unify that I use for a lot of my deliverables. And, so I just kind of drag this template over on the page and then and it fill in the blank. So it, it's still a lot of work, but it, it wasn't quite that hard. But as you can see here, I have the persona that we're aiming for, right? The goal, uh, the previous view, the previous screen she was looking at and how she got to that page, the, the next screen that she was going to be looking at so you had a sense of context where she was in the system. Then I listed the capabilities that we wanted to make sure we were providing and the problems we, the specific problems we need to solve. So that's a whole lot of work. Um, I didn't really do that for that long. I think I still have the template somewhere, but I don't really use it very often. But it's pretty clear. It's a page overview as to what the hell is going on. You can walk into any meeting over the course of a project and have this page, and it's always the same. And every time you start the meeting, everybody remembers, oh yeah, this is what we're doing, right? This is why we only have one save button on the screen. Um, but I said it takes a long time, so I've gotten really lazy now. And now I have a style and a design that's called Y, and it changes the word Y, or any word really, into all caps and orange. And so I have my documentation, and so I have a feature there. And after I mentioned, describe just what the feature is, I type the word Y, hit my style to make it orange, and I type why the hell the feature's there. And this is important because you won't be in every meeting, and even if you are in every meeting, you won't remember why you included a feature. So uh, one of my pet peeves is when something small, simple, and easy, right, gets cut because no one understands why it's important. Um, so the example here is uh, the third column, 4.4, .4, a checklist for getting started, all right? Um, it's just a simple checklist for things to do, right? That'd be the first thing that's cut if you're running late, right? Who's gonna write the checklist? We don't give a shit, right? Just sign and work. Um, but why do we need it? Because explicit guidance like checklist increases the number of uh, who participate, right? And that's the goal, right? It's increase the number of people who are participating in the project program. If you, this is the feature you're gonna cut over making sure the password request works, um, that's what you're trading off, right? You're trading off 
uh, your core project goal versus just you know a standard uh, customer service thing. I'm not saying it's a, a good decision, but the point is, you everybody when they make the decision, either cut or keep or change a feature, knows knows all the background about why the feature is there in the first place, which means they make better decisions, right? So it's not about changing the decisions, it's about making better decisions about user experience. Um, Yeah, sorry to repeat the previous slide. Um, I'm sick, and I'm on Benadryl, so you have to, I want to be a little blase about a couple of things here. So here's the fifth barrier, right? The organization design quality is too low. Um, and we've all had good engineers design bad things. Now, everybody in here is like an awesome user experience designer, right? What do y'all do? Y'all, who does visual design, copywriting, content? What do you do? I'll, I'll take volunteers. What do you do? Design development. What do you do? Okay. Who does something different? Anybody? Wait. Teach design. Okay. Write the content. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, this is good then. This is about this is about how teams work. So. Um, a lot of times you'll be sitting around in the project room, you're, everybody's going to be talking about what they're going to do, and everybody walks off, right? And people go and do things, and they come back, and you're like, that's not really expected, but okay, whatever, right? They did a good job, whatever. Um, but that's terrible, right? Because the whole point of like pushing a product out is that everybody's on the same page. That's, that's, that's what makes the product successful. Um, to use the, the, the lame old, old example, right, of Apple, the reason their products rock is because everybody's on the same page, right? Everybody's forced to be on the same page. There aren't a bunch of people pulling things in different directions. Um, so when you're in that project group, right, and you're all talking about the, the, way, what it's, way, the way the project's going to go, um, you have to be really clear about exactly what's going on about what your expectations are, right? So um, you want to tell a better story. And I use the term story because in, in Agile shops, right, that's the you use user stories. A lot of times it's, you know, as an administrator, I want to change my preferences. Um, so that I'm not getting as many emails, right? Whatever the story is, it's pretty, they're pretty lame and it gives some framing that very good. But a story always has a main character, right? So it might be a session attendee, that's you. Uh, there's an event that happens in the story, right? Tweets, a point from the presentation. Uh, there are other actors, right? Because you're always interacting with something else uh, to their stream. And you have a motivation, right? So you can share the point with their friends. But a shared stories also have a common language, and this is the most important part. The assumption about all the other parts of the story is that, is that everybody understands all the parts of it equally, but that's not always true. So um, in order to make, if you went and gave that top story to um, 12 different teams, it would come back you know, roughly 12 different ways, right? Because there are probably a million ways to implement that specific functionality. But if you told them, gave them a common language reference point and said the interaction should be like sharing something on Google+, there's no ambiguity there, right? No ambiguity there. So I actually um, used this, uh, something, used something similar when I was working with uh, Kelsey at Chai One. And uh, there was like a little overlay when you hovered over someone's avatar and some functionality happened. I didn't have time to design it, so I said, make it like Flickr. And a couple days later, I came back and the developer had made it like Flickr. And it was exactly what I expected. He knew exactly what to provide and it worked the way he wanted it to work. Barrier six, the organization doesn't understand what it takes to do user experience. So this is, um, um, and actually the organization doesn't really understand everything it takes to do anything any of us do, right? Because they give you your assignment, you go off to your cube, you're there for a few hours or a few days, and you come back, and magic, right? And your cube is like that black box where the magic happens. Um, but the way to change this with user experience and make it more concrete and, concrete and tangible is to stick everything you do on the walls, right? Um, photocopy your sketch, print your next wireframe, cre create your next sitemap out of post-it notes on the public wall. Um, if you create a lot of content, right? I've been places where I stick all the different drafts up and have you know, all my colored version, then I have the new one on top of that and edit all over that, right? You can do this with um, visual design. Uh, can't really do it with code, but I figure engineers have it easy enough as it is. Um, so there are a couple things about this. So you want to choose a wall where key influencers will pass by, right? Because if just the guy next in the cube next to you is the only person who sees it, big whoop. They probably hear you whine about this stuff all the time. You want the CEO to walk by, right? You want your manager's boss to walk by. That's that's you want key influencers to walk by and see this stuff because that's who you're trying to trying to you know um, 
mind warp there. Um, you want to encourage people to go and scribble edits on the wall. I did this at Convio, and one of the most awesome things I'm walking by and I see engineers over at a couple mock-ups like scribbling on them and changing something. That's awesome, right? Because you're not, it's not your work, right? It's the organization's work, and everybody should be involved in making it better. And you want to post all your iterations, right? So when I do a set of wireframes, I might have 20, 20, 30 files of iteration changes, right? Those are all on my computer. When you deliver stuff, they only ever see the final, right? You need to make sure that it's clear how much work actually goes into getting to the final. One of my biggest worries is that you deliver an interface that's super clean, super simple, good interfaces don't look like they took any time to come up with, right? That's how clean and simple they are. Um, but in reality, it takes lots and lots of work to get to that kind of simplicity. So this is an example from the ladders. They're, they're, um, an H, uh, recruiting, or recruiting website, kind of like um, uh, Hot Jobs uh, in New York. They put all their process in the wall. These are all the screens. You can see the further along they actually have mock-ups as opposed to just wireframes and sketches. They put everything on the wall. Um, everybody is in the room, all the content people, all the design people, all the UX people, all the des developers are always in the room at the same time designing features so everybody's on the same page. And everybody can go and look at what they did and remember what, why they did it because it's all stuck on the wall. Um, Here's the seventh barrier. You have no way to validate good, good UX. And um, again, UX is fuzzy for a lot of people, so that's, that's OK. Um, but it's a lot of bullshit, right? So it's as easy said as done. So here's what you do. We're going we're gonna to do a quick survey here, OK? We're going to evaluate the user experience of the chairs you're sitting in right now. So we're going to choose what we want to measure, and that is the comf how comfortable your chair is, OK? Uh, we're going to choose a scale, which is a comparison. So we're going to compare it to uh, you want to compare it to your, your, off your chair at work or the couch at home? What, what, which, what, what's your comparison? Anybody? Couch. All right, so that's our comparison. Is the chair you're sitting on right now as comfortable as your couch at home? Um, and set your target. How good do you want to be? Do you want to be as comfortable, more comfortable than the couch at home, or less comfortable? Um, and we're going to measure. All right, so now raise your hand if the chair you're sitting in is more comfortable than your couch at home. Nobody. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We don't. I mean, that's not our target, right? Maybe we're shooting for as comfortable. So, raise your hand if the chair you're sitting on is as comfortable as your couch at home. Wow. All right. So we have one. So that was our target. Only one one chair meets that target. Um, everybody is less comfortable than your couch at home, right? Right. Oh, come on. Less comfortable than the couch at home. All right. There you go. Thank you. Um, that's easy. You can do that with anything, right? You can compare. You can, compare quick, you, can, you can compare Quicken to a pencil, right? How easy do your taxes with Quicken versus with a pencil at home? Any two experiences, you can compare them. The important thing is that you know what your comparison is and you know how good you want your experience to be compared to what you're working with. So maybe your sign-in is, is as easy as Yahoo's or um, maybe your photo sharing experience is, is, only, is, is way better than Flickr's. Or maybe, or maybe for uh, an onboarding process, you don't care if it's even at parity through competitors competitors, you just want it to be usable, right? That's a business decision is, is what, at what level does that feature need to be, but the comparison and your target are what make it easy to evaluate. And anybody in your team can do it. Um, you can do this in a, with a circle of people and you just kind of take the average of everything there and either agree, you've either met your target or you haven't. It's, um, if you haven't, you keep working or you decide whether or not to. So, and that's, what time is it? Okay. All right, so this is, this is the user experience health check here. Um, and this is essentially the exercise we just did stuck in a spreadsheet with numbers. So you can actually graph it and put it on uh, roll-up reports that go up to your executives because they like graphs and numbers, right? Not because they're lazy or stupid, because that's easy to grok quickly and they're busy people. So here we can see, right, we've got the capability. Um, you've got the, com the comparative experience, right? That's in the competitor's column. The target, which is the number which compares to better than uh, best in class, better than competitors, at parity with, just usable. Um, and then you have, you know, columns, right, for the measurement in March, and there's how far away we were from our target, right? This is, this is easy. Um, and it's not fuzzy, fuzzy fake math, right? This is, this is a real assessment you can do. You put numbers on it. The point isn't the numbers are accurate at any one slice in time. The point is that you can track progress over, over a course in time, and it's internally consistent. So you can evaluate every experience and you should do that, right? It's, everybody should be, you should be doing this for all your projects. So these are seven barriers, right? They exist in almost every organization, right? You can get through all of them. These are, if you're interested in this stuff, these are, this is a selection of books that, um, 
it's kind of about working better, right, with your teams and organizations. The one on the bottom right is uh, one that I co-wrote, and it's not there because I'm trying to sell more books, but because I really think it is one of the best introductions to user experience. If if you're just getting into it, or you're you're not a guru yet, or the polar bear book looks really thick and academic. This is, is designed for uh, content people, designers, engineers, managers, project managers, to get them up to speed on user experience. Um, and there's the trusted advisors in the bottom left. I was mentioning that earlier. So Rocket Surgery Made Easy. These are all great books. They're all really, really short, uh, cheap, um, easy to read. And there's something you can like, throw on someone's desk when they're not, you know, after they, after they leave and they'll come up in the morning and find it and maybe change the way they think. And if uh, you go to work on Monday and you're getting some pushback on something, you're like, Yo, I'm going to make this rock, right? And they say no. It's important to remember that no is only part of now. Any no that anyone ever gives you is only right then. And the next step that you have to say is, OK, we can't do it now. At what point can we implement this? Right? That's the secret. If you can't change it now, get them to commit to how you can change it in the future, because it can always be changed in the future. So we have some time for questions. What's stopping you from being a fit non-smoker? Anyone else? Yeah. I have a mm -hmm. um, for barrier five, you had that everyone needs to be clear about the way the project is going to go. What if you, which I just thought of this, what if you have the kind of boss that you bring them, they always say, bring me three options for the brochure, for the, you know, the guerrilla marketing, you do that, and then when it comes to the board meeting, because you're, they say, what does everyone think? Let's all give our input. Right, right. Well, the, there you need two books, right? The first is The Trusted Advisor, and the second is Communicating Design by Dan Brown. That's really about doing user experience deliverables, but each deliverable in there, he actually talks about how you present it to different types of people. Um, and that's, that's two things, right? That's an, as a, expectations aren't being managed, right? You want it to be an approval meeting, and they're thinking it's a collaborative design session, right? Neither one is better or worse than the other. It's just expectations are different. And, and another is just, is just a set of personal boundaries, right? For example, when anybody comes to me, and this is people, this vaguely religious argument here, but someone comes to me and says, I want three versions. No, right? I will give you my one best version, unless I don't know, and then I'll come up with two that I think are really good. But you're not going to get three versions. And I feel really bad. There are a lot of visual designers out there that have to come up with three versions of shit all the time. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's just bad. And I think that if you set your boundaries accurately, you won't have and you're communicating them that that's the relationship you work out, right? If, if your boss understands you need an approval meeting instead of a collaborative session, then he can arrange that for you, right? He wants you to succeed because that makes him succeed. Any more questions? No? Oh, sweet. OK. <laughs> I don't know if that's sweet. But I, I, hope, I hope this has been useful. But before we leave, I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts, right? In the UX world right now, there's a whole bunch of stuff about Agile UX and Lean UX, et cetera. And I don't know if you've seen the Lean Startup book from, from Eric Ries, but one of the big things there is build, measure, learn, right? Build something, measure how well it does, learn from what you measured, and rebuild it, right? So that's what user experience is all about. And, but a lot of times, people take the phrases like Agile and Lean, and they think it means you know, kind of skimpy and um, um, malnourished, right? but that's not true. Um, what that means is that you're just doing, you're, you're, instead of having one user experience guy cranking out all these deliverables, is that everybody in your organization kind of does it. Right? It's just part of the, your, the um, musculature of your organization. And that's what you want to do, right? You want to make your organization a healthy user experience culture. And if any of kind of this slant on user experience is intriguing to you, there is an organization called Balance Team, right? which is all about having everybody in your organization is kind of pro UX and understands its value and everybody helps contribute towards it. Um, they have a blog at balanceteam.org and there's a mailing list you can get to from there. And there are um, a couple good resources here. The one that at, is Luxor, that's actually the Lean UX residency. It's a six weeks, six week user experience residency for startups in San Francisco where they pay thousands of dollars to come in and be kind of walk through the user experience process. 
It's very successful, and it um, makes money, right? If you're a startup in San Francisco, you're not gonna blow a bunch of your bootstrap cash on something that doesn't work. And the second one is a presentation by Jeff Gotthelf I mentioned earlier called Getting Out of the Deliverables Business, which is all about just making the organization do better user experience and not really about delivering wireframes or mockups or um, copy decks. So um, and I think that is, that is it. Yes, that is it. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be here uh, for a little while. You can always catch me online. Thanks.